Okay, everyone, uh, we're going to get started. Hopefully, we, we got everything under control. Um, I want to start with a little bit about projects first, so that we are all on the same page with respect to that. So um, earlier, I shared in our projects channel uh, some things that we have to do. Um, where is it? Okay, here it is. Okay, so uh, you have to declare your team. So that means uh, you need to come up with a name for your team and put it in our spreadsheet. Okay, so um, the spreadsheet is, of course, in the general channel. I'm talking about column C. So a number of you guys have put in, I guess there's a, a group from RC5, which is great. Um, but we have many others, especially uh, those of you in my own group, none of you have declared what you're working on. Our yeah. uh, RCS uh, 61101 uh, students, most of them have not, all of them have not declared what they're working on. So uh, you'll need to fill out this column. And the only thing is, uh, please try to keep it consistent. So if you're working with one group, use the same identifier for everyone in the group, okay? Second, you need to copy the slide deck uh, that's pinned here. So there's a slide deck right here, okay? You open it up. You make a copy of the entire presentation. Okay, uh, I'll just put it somewhere, wherever it goes. Okay, I'll delete it later. And uh, you just need to customize uh, whatever you're going to write. So this is, uh, you know, um, GPT chat. Uh, okay, and some team member, another team member, and then you have to fill this part out okay to archive if you don't mind it being uh, put on a public place for other people to copy from, okay? Otherwise, it'll just stay internal to our Slack group. Nobody else will see it, okay? You can delete this or hide this. A lot of people have just hidden it, okay? And then fill out some information. So usually you need a base paper, you know, just put an archive link uh, or, or link to a published uh, thing, and then you're all set. For team availability, uh, you know, you, you can just write out the, the three weeks from now. So this is week 05, right? Uh, week six and seven. And then for each team member uh, that you write up in the front, uh, add a column and then put your available with res uh, respect to a work week. So work week is about 40 hours. Okay, so um, eight hours a day. So if you think you can work a half a day on a project, then you would put like uh, maybe 10%, uh, okay? All right, so this is just your notional. I'm not going to tag you for that, but it's important to have that down and, and put some ideas of what objectives you're trying to do, okay? So um, then you would take this deck uh, wherever it is, okay? Um, make it something that other people can view, copy the link, and then uh, dump it into project. Okay, and uh, you just need to uh, start a new thread with this because the whole point is that uh, other people can comment. Okay, so uh, it'll stay inside of the thread and that way it won't clutter up the channel. So as we do subsequent updates, okay, for example, two weeks from now in week seven, you have your second update, you copy the second slide deck. Okay, the second slide deck is almost the same as the first, it just changes uh, some extra slides here. You can just copy these slides into your uh, deck one, okay, and just modify it, okay, that's fine. And then you can just, for example, simply go back to your project thread and say, okay, we've updated our slide deck for iteration two. 
uh, and then you know give Michael and myself uh, just some notice that uh, we can review it. Okay, something like that. So uh, again, when you uh, go for the next couple of slides um, for subsequent ones, if you have more information that you want to highlight that are different from your original slides, let's say these two parts are new, just uh, do us a favor and highlight it so we know what we're looking at, okay? Things that are not highlighted uh, and not indicated as new slides, we probably won't review, okay? All right, are there any questions about how to do this? Everyone needs to do this by today. So I hope over the course of today's uh, uh, session, if I check uh, this column out, uh, it will have more data about um, what your projects are, okay? All right. Okay, if you have questions, uh, write them on the project channel so that uh, I can take them asynchronously. Okay, because I know we have a long schedule. Every time we're some administrative, we need to play Kahoot. So all of that takes time. So um, again, that is something uh, I know a lot of us have to deal with uh, the management of time. And trust me, your lectures and NUS have this problem too. That's why we always uh, end our, our uh, sessions a bit late. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have uh, one of our um, support uh, from lecture four created the Kahoot. So who is that? Is that person in the room? Okay. So um, you will help narrate. Um, yeah, so maybe you can come up and, and narrate uh, as we go through. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name again. Nisha, okay. So Nisha will be narrating. Huh? Disha. 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 Disha, okay. Everyone in? Anyone missing? Okay, I think we can start. Yeah. Which of the following is not one of the smoothing techniques that solves the sparse data problem? Can it be dragged out of the way? That's the caption. It's the exponential smoothing. It is not one of the smoothing techniques for this. Okay. This is a multi select. What are the limitations of RNNs? <laughs> Thank 
two. The caption. Can you move it up here? Oh, no, it's actually going in there. Oh, yes, no, it's fine. Also, maybe. Okay, so the answer was bias, uh, everything except bias variance trade. What does long short term memory mean? It's a short term memory that lasts for a long time. Okay. In transformer, our query key and value always same. They are seeing only in encoders. The IWKV replaces the dot product calculation with which operation? Awesome. It's the addition of learned pairwise position biases. Okay. Which of the following is not a component of RWKV architecture? Weight mixing. Okay. Last two questions. Films are still reading. Which of the following are true for SSM based? Uh, SSM based on H3 paper. All of them are true. All right, last question. Meaning is a relationship between is based on vendor and caller. Awesome, almost everyone got it. Our graphics cards in third place. Young in second place, and always in the front for the last couple of questions. So, congratulations, everyone. Okay, so uh, thanks for that recap from last week. So I think we can go ahead and, and look at the slides for this week. Uh, so go to our modeling deck. Let's see whether we can get the captions out of the way. Okay. Um, 
So who's presenting first? Bavitya, okay, Bavitya, are you there? Can you hear us? I know you're remote. Bavitya, are you online? Um, he just uh, DM me saying that he has some emergency currency and he might be delayed. Um, okay. So do we want to go over Bavitya section together? Maybe we just do try to do that. Um, since he's not around. So we have about 13 slides to cover. So why don't we try to do it together since he's not able to present. So we're gonna go over different types of language models. There's two papers here, which uh, uh, you can click from the slides. Um, so going over uh, the different types of language models and byte pair encoding. So I've not seen these uh, slides before, so we'll just try to narrate. Um, so we are talking about um, encoder decoder uh, or encoder style models or ones that are only decoder style. So I want to get some comments from you guys in the audience. Um, What's the, the different characteristics? Can anyone explain what's in the middle column? Why, why we say these uh, different properties? Again, try to limit our answers so that we can just quickly cover it. Oh, sorry, go back out. All right, um, when we think of encoder, decoder, or encoder style, right, we're, we're doing uh, mass language modeling, so we are just trying to encode a specific training data set, right, and then we have uh, specific words that we omit, and that we're trying to figure out what to place there, so it's the discriminative modeling case, right, why is that, because we're trying to match the exact words that's out there, right, what about um, uh, the generative style decoder ones. Why, why do we call this an autoregressive language model rather than a mass language model? Come on, you guys. This should be predicts hopefully... tokens. Right. Instead, of not, uh, instead of not learning through masking like the decoders over the days. Okay, so it doesn't really have a ground truth to start with, right? It's just predicting the next model. So it's um, just decoding whatever state that's already there and, and progressing to the next state. And so that's why we call these generative models as well. Uh, although really when we think about it, um, the ones over here can be made to generate because they're generating new, new uh, words from a probabilistic uh, distribution, but just that there, there's an answer, right? So uh, that's why we, we tend to think of this as more discriminative, choosing from one of many uh, and, and not necessarily inventing new words, trying to target that one. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this slide. Um, so again, when we think about encoder decoder models, um, there are lots of them. Uh, often they'll have a uh, encoder to read the input and uh, a decoder to generate the output, right? And uh, we need to be able to train them in a way that um, tries to allow the output to match um, the original output, right? So, um, when we think about ones that are just encoder ones, right? We, we don't care about the output. We just in care that the, the prediction matches the original um, input text. So uh, we can train them with mass uh, word prediction models, right? Uh, so we've seen quite a few representations of this already in the previous lecture over the last two weeks about how to do that through um, representations um, that are either the, the basic ones, the uh, distilled ones, or ones with uh, many tasks involved. Okay, um, so I forget your name. Um, can you? Uh, Liang. Liang. So Liang already said that when we think about 
a uh, auto regressive model. It's a generative model. It's not trained necessarily on uh, just generating um, any arbitrary word, but just refined for next word prediction, right? So that makes them auto regressive. Regressive means, of course, predicting output, and auto meaning reflecting on the previous um, uh, from the previous outputs. Okay. Um, so we've already seen uh, many of these different uh, uh, cases, and they work well for few shot and zero shot cases. Okay. And um, over the last couple of lectures, we've seen um, people, uh, students in, in our class talk about their abilities to deal with uh, zero shot and few shot uh, through prompting and, and chain of thought uh, in context demonstrations. Anyone would like to add anything to that? Okay, so uh, some of you in your projects may be playing with prompting. I think that's a very easy type of uh, a project to do because it requires very little compute, right? So if you're not sure, you don't have access to a lot of compute, you may want to just try to do a model, uh, a project that relies on prompting only inference, right? Without any need to fine tune or, or, or retrain models from scratch. Those of you who are adventurous, and not or, okay, and have ability to have compute, then you can choose something a little bit more heavy duty, right? So there's, uh, I think this tree is not very complete because yeah, I, I, 2023 is only here. We're already more than halfway and there's a lot more things on the top of that, right? And you can see that quite a lot is happening in the decoder only space. Can I get a sense from you guys? Why do you think that decoder only models are uh, working? I mean, it's so much traffic on this side of the tree. Why don't we have a lot of work on uh, these other models, right? Encoder, uh, encoder, decoder plus encoder only. Encoding is more work. Can you give a, uh, can you elaborate on your response? Nicholas, right? Yeah. Uh huh. So you get, I don't know the numbers, but I would expect that if you want to work with an encoder model, then you have to spend your computational resources first getting the embeddings and everything. But a decoder is basically like taking the embedding for free and you're just doing fine tuning or it's more meaningful. So I think there's less parameters and they found out that it still works, we won't involve the encoder. So if you just decoder only, right? So still has you still able to get like the almost the same performance. Okay. So any extra parameters you use your compute by the way, so that you affect the like you have to spend more like you need more compute than you need to and not all that stuff. So okay. So Warren said it seems like uh applications are not heavily affected by the encoding stage. We freeze the encodings, meaning as Nicholas pointed out, have the embeddings coming out from the models after doing the encoding stage, the downstream things work okay. Um, I'd also encourage you guys to try to speak up because I know a lot of the support staff have trouble transcribing afterwards because the microphone, I mean, it's a good microphone, but it only picks up a little bit locally. Yeah. Uh, Shen Long? Yeah, Professor, I think um, one reason that the, the decoder is more popular because it is easier to scale up. Right. So Shen Long also said something similar to Warren, meaning that um, maybe it's easier to scale up. Okay, do let's just have a poll of hands here. How many of you think that uh, what we're doing in encoder is already optimal and we don't need to work on encoding architectures? No one? Okay, that was sort of a biased question, right? I phrased it in such a way that, uh, you know, I think uh, there's still quite a lot of work to do. But I think uh, for applications, it's clear that people are already saying there is enough done in the encoder. You can already use the embeddings. We've been using like Glove and, and um, FastText and, and a number of other embedding models, uh, including Elmo and BERT for quite a while already, right? And they they haven't run out of steam yet. So I guess that's why people are, are looking more on the, the left or the right side of the tree on this slide, right? Uses and applications. Any other quick comments? Yeah, Heng Chan, uh, actually, can you speak I, up? Yeah, actually, previously, I mean that um, it comes with, uh, you see that uh, we find that the uh, encoder only model has more like low rank 
information uh, compared to the enclosure. So I'm, I'm not quite still not quite fully on the with the program. I mean, after I search for some related reports that tell me that the program is uh there are less repeated information in the transformation matrix like in the encoder model. So which means in the encoder only possibly there are more repeated characters in the in the in, in the matrix. So probably that means the encoder is less repeated. Okay, is that uh maybe after encoding we have low rank representations, meaning that um you know the data is already quite dense. Um, there's not a lot of repetitiveness. Is that what you're saying, or, or maybe you're saying the opposite? I didn't quite catch. Uh, yeah, I think the opposite. So opposite. Yeah, yeah. So people have low rank, people have high rank. Okay, so maybe there, uh, the amount of signal in the decoder, uh, sorry, the encoder is already uh, overrepresenting uh, the information, and then you can use that redundancy when you're doing decoding. So. There's already enough packed into uh, our representations after doing encoding. Yes, from my current understanding, yes, but I'm also not really sure about that. Okay, other and comments? I, yeah, Warren? It also wouldn't say that encoder only, like, there's, there's no more work done for encoding, uh, because this it's like multi modality, right? You're now using like a visual encoder to encode like the visual embedding, and then you try and mix that into the, 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 the language embedding space in order to like. Use images as forms as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's another way you can like you can change the modality of things and, and do research on that side. Like more time, like more time modality and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Did everyone catch that? All right. So um there's one thing that we're we are clear about is that when a language model encodes and decodes, okay, that um we are mixing together um domain specific and other types of information that's sort of spe specific to a context as well as general information that we would want any learner to have right like if you think about um let's say a university graduate or let's say better yet a phd student right you want somebody who's graduate with a doctoral degree to be able to take on any task right and reason about it and then decompose that task into parts and then solve all the parts, okay? Um, so it doesn't really matter whether that doctoral student has domain-specific information, right? So I just say, you, you know how to think about thinking, all right? You know common sense reasoning and things like that. So we want to encode that sort of, uh, sort of um, knowledge, just general knowledge, common sense knowledge or, or strategic knowledge as you will, okay? And perhaps try to forget or move away from information that is uh, a vertical application, something that might be specific to a particular domain, right? And uh, push that out of what we might encode uh, on the, the left-hand side, right? If we can do that, then our, our foundation model, or uh, you know, more generally a foundation model rather than a large language model, right? That foundation model can pick up uh, information um, that we can uh, sensitize it through fine tuning or in context demonstration while decoding, and then be able to do uh, specific information uh, tasks on the right hand side. Okay, so there is this divide, right? Because a lot of people, when we say a large language model, even with zero shot, it can do things that are in a vertical domain, right? Because it's seen all of that vertical domain information before, like solving math problems or, or answering general census information from Wikipedia, all of those things are sort of in there already. But if we want to take some of that vertical information out and just say, I have a general reasoner, something like an AGI, okay? Then can I just imbue it uh, while decoding with specific vertical information, for example, information from my corporate intranet, okay? And let it solve problems from there. Okay, so right now we're not at that divide. We don't have a clear the, the division of labor between things that are general reasoning, right? That we could say, you know, a step by step thought or whatever, and and um and information within a domain. And it's not clear that we would need it, but I think that um somewhat addresses what Hang Chan was talking about.
Okay, so I think Bhagavitya included another section on tokenization because it forms the basis for quite a lot of things down here, right? So all of these things about fast text, word to vec and glove, they come with the token representations that we're going to then do encoding for, right? So a tokenizer basically converts a string into a sequence of text, okay? We can use white space, but of course, white space, there is problems, right? So I anticipate this slide without having seen it, that uh, in CJK languages, Asian languages a lot, we don't have spaces, right? So that means we have to deal with that. Um, even when there are spaces, for example, in German, uh, you have to be able to uh, parse out noun phrases. So noun phrases are in German, there are compound words, so something like, uh, I, I won't try to pronounce this, but this is a single word. It's got three components to it. Um, and so you would actually want to segment that out and uh, put it into separate tokens in order to process that, right? Because if you look at this entire word as a single word, and then you treat that as a single token, uh, probably you wouldn't have seen it enough, okay? It's sort of like OOV, just like, if you think about a trigram or a five-gram in English, you know, likely those word sequences are not common. And so it's uh, often going to be the case that you won't have any information for that word or, or that phrase, right? So I, I need to be able to cut up tokens into their smallest uh, morpheme, okay? Smallest unit of orthographic content, you know, meaning that I can see it uh, written out, okay? That has some meaning to it. Right, so in English, oftentimes it's a, a, a syllable, okay, uh, that gives some meaning, right? Like a S at the end of a word in English as a, usually a plural. So it carries information that is last S that carries syntactic, uh, grammatical information. Okay, so there are lots of different ways to do um, uh, tokenization, uh, one that, um, about Vitya covered is this paper on uh, NMT, Neural Machine Translation, uh, looking at subword units, right? And uh, he writes here, uh, one of the key motivation is that some words uh, can be uh, easily uh, segmented into known subwords, and then we can translate those subwords um, into another language and then recombine them into uh, a single word, okay? So there are lots of different ways that we can do this. Uh, we can say sometimes there are uh, alignment in languages because uh, particular uh, phrases might be imported directly, right? So um, you can take a word in a foreign language and transliterate it phonetically into another language. You know, for example, there are some words in Tamil that might have come from English. You just bring them over, right? or some words in Chinese that uh, make it into English. For example, when we say dim sum in American English, you know, it's from the Cantonese, okay? So we, we're just using that. And so when we do that, uh, like Barack Obama in English, and I can't pronounce Russian, but you can see it's almost the same, then uh, we can align these two because they sound the same or, or graphically look similar, right? Um, there are things like this as well when we use cognates. So when we have two uh, words that have the same, uh, for example, Latin origin, you know, they were, uh, I, you can think of it as being encoded in Latin and decoded into English and German, okay? And then you can put them together because you know that they come from a common root, right? And then other things like uh, what we talked about where uh, a complex word, uh, such as a uh, German word, is composed of uh, particles or individual elements that are morphemes that are uh, put together, right? So um, there's a case here of a solar system, right? So um, when we uh, do this with things like BPE, um, byte pair uh, encoding, all right? BPE is one of the methods that we use for tokenization. It is the data-driven method for tokenization. All right, so what does it mean? It means that if I have a corpus, like uh, the one on line one, okay, which is uh, originally all just single letters, okay, so I say each single letter is the token, all right, and I want to uh, try to assemble more meaningful tokens from this without deleting any of the original tokens, okay, 
then what I'm going to do is look for commonalities between these, right? And find uh, patterns that are adjacent patterns of words, you know, basically subsequences that are contiguous, right? So if you look at this, there's a TH that happens three times, right? So I'm going to say um, in all three of these cases, I'm going to create a TH token. I'm going to put that on the list of tokens, all right? And uh, wherever I see a T and an H as two separate tokens, I'm going to combine them together, right? And I can recurse this as many times as I want. So I do it with THE. So I have the as a token by itself. And then uh, CA in uh, these two lines, three and four, it occurs twice and I put that together. So I have the original tokens, right? All six letters, but I have also started to compile um, higher gram tokens, right? Ones that I pulled two grams, two separate uh, original atomic tokens together. I fused them and I say, this is another token, okay? So um, doing this type of way, uh, this is the BPE algorithm. Uh, we can um, take uh, a corpus and assemble uh, a number of uh, tokens that come as a result of that. And uh, all this is showing is that even though we have um, 129 million ways to combine uh, two uh, bigrams of characters next to each other, um, we are selectively choosing a large subset of that, okay? But it can represent all of the information there, okay? So we get, uh, we can represent all of the different uh, character bigrams. I'm not sure why there's some unknown tokens here. But if we accept uh, some other way of doing this, and I'm not sure about this in the paper, you can check it out, okay? Then uh, we can still have some unknown tokens, but we are shrinking the number of um, tokens that are representing while increasing the number of types that we have, okay? Any question about this? So um, the way, uh, the ones that we have here are other, uh, other methods, Morpheus is another uh, morphological analyzer that came in, out in the early 2000s, okay, uh, which was uh, developed specifically for languages like uh, Norwegian, um, Swedish, okay, all the Scandinavian languages that have very complex morphology, okay. So basically, um, there are lots of words in those languages that occur very seldomly because they take into account uh, gender, whether it's active or passive, whether it's in, in some type of other construction, okay? Okay, so uh, I think the whole point of that section is to say that uh, these parts, when we are talking about tokenization, they're really important because they form the basis for how we're doing all of the encoding and decoding, right? Um, we already know that NLP works in the pipeline, right? Whatever you do at the front of the pipeline, if you make mistakes, those things cascade downstream, right? So if you get your tokenization off by a little bit, it could have fairly large effects downstream, right? And that's why it's important uh, to do that properly. Previous methods that were rule-based before data-driven methods like BPE, they tended to make pretty good tokenizations, but because they're not customized to the data, they can't fit the data very well, okay? They're sort of underfitting, if you will, okay? And that causes a lot of performance lags, okay? So uh, it's not to say that- um, I'm updating this slides a little bit, maybe you want to- Okay, that. yeah, There's so we'll just refresh this. Manual analysis, you added. Okay, so we try to uh, put something there. Okay, so uh, he's uh, gone on to add a, a couple other slides. Yeah. So it just, again, I'm watching time, making sure we can cover it quickly um, to say that, yeah, uh, what we said before that uh, there are certain cases of subwords that um, don't work very well. And so there are subsystems that handle um, the case where you split the morphemes too much. So you need to aggregate them together or having inconsistent segmentation. That happens a lot when you have tokens that um, 
have some type of uh, dependency. So for example, if you uh, take a look at case that we use in our NLP class, like Los Angeles dash San Francisco, okay? And you can think of that as like a flight from Los Angeles or from San Francisco. And when you write it up, sometimes you don't put the space between Angeles and San, you just put a dash, okay? If you go with white space tokenization, what happens? The Angeles San becomes a single token, right? So that's an incorrect splitting. So we need to deal with those cases as well, okay? Um, so yeah, I don't think we have time to go over all the, the different parts here. Um, you can take a look at the original paper. Uh, but Vidya, are you online? Yes, Professor. Do you want to say anything about these other slides? Uh, yeah, so these slides, most of them are like self-explanatory. So in BP60 and BP Join, they create two separate dictionaries. The first one in which source and target languages are different dictionaries, BP and BP Join in which they share the same dictionaries. And you can see like, you know, uh, as compared to our source, as compared to other previous techniques also, how they're not able to separate such morphologically diverse words, like their motivation for the paper and how when it comes to PPE, they are able to do it properly. And there was also this one small thing, like uh, how when they use independent encoding, so what happens in independent encoding is the same name, maybe segmented differently in each language. So it makes hard for the language models to you know, learn mapping between subword events. So, and also I think during the lecture, so Alexandra Birch, who wrote this paper, was a professor in a book back in Edinburgh, so she told me like how using the same vocabulary for both source and target actually helps in reducing the overall size of the vocabulary and makes the model a bit faster than having two separate vocabularies for both source and target. So yeah, that's my two cents. Okay, did everyone catch that? No? Okay, so I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit because I'm a little bit closer to the speaker. Um, so uh, Bhavitya said, uh, when we take a joint vocabulary, what does a joint vocabulary mean? It means that the vocabulary of tokens for both the target and source language are the same vocabulary, okay? If you look at BPE 60K, it means that I have 60K for the target language as well as 60K for the uh, source language. So these don't necessarily have to be the same, okay? When we do a joint BPE means we just put all the text together, whether it's from the source or the target, and we train BPE on this entire set, we get out a single set of um, tokens, right? So that helps to get performance better. Like you can see in this situation, the performance, I think on a previous slide, uh, showed uh, slightly better results. Uh, so this is a new slide that he put in, okay? But uh, you can think about whether that scales up or not, okay? Because, uh, you know, the joint encoding required two languages to put together. If you think I want to translate from N languages to another N languages, that means you would need to put all of these N languages into one corpus, train BP on the entire set of data, and then truncate that set of tokens to some amount, right? And, and that could be more expensive, but it might generalize better. Okay, any any questions? Yeah. So sure. I like what does BP let you do for like multi language? Like because like some words, right? At least if you, if you can do it in fast characters, like let's say German to English, right? They using like the same A to Z, but then like most like Chinese and stuff, right? When you represent in Unicode, sometimes like oh, but I don't really want to apply, but sometimes when you speed up focus, right? Like if you just speed up with your own like like byte strings, but then that's not the entire word itself, because like maybe a Chinese code will spend multiple byte byte yeah. strings. Yeah, also the byte codes. Yeah, byte codes. Yeah. So in that case, right, like, is it still effective to use BP or is it, is it, is it like a need for multilingual and uh, beyond BP or is BP still able to handle those kind of things? Okay, the question that Warren was asking is whether if we are using different character sets, which means that the Unicode um, offsets within the entire Unicode stream are different. Like uh, when we uh, capture Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, they're in different parts of the bytecode space for uh, UTF, right? Uh, but uh, for example, ISO, ISO uh, whatever, I forget, uh, 2259 or whatever, uh, for encoding um, Latin one, okay? 
that that happens to encode most European languages. So um, having a joint encoding makes sense there, right? Do we get any savings for using BPE for cases where the Unicode space is uh, separate? Like language A is in one part of the byte space, language B is in another part. So what do you guys think? Would that help or hurt? Not only that, but can like BB also separate like words that are not English related, like Chinese words, like uh, semantically correct. Like, because sometimes in my when you stuff like the Chinese word, there's like more than one byte, right? Then the algorithm separate like a Chinese word into like just its individual. Yeah, so go ahead. Look at like Chinese, can you speak up? Like, the algorithm separate the Chinese word into like individual I think there's limited uh, capability to do that, but like, uh, what's by our participant? Your name again, sir? Uh, Marcus. Marcus, right? So Marcus was saying that there are other tokenizers and other strategies for that. I think it depends a lot on how we're representing that information uh, into a into the byte stream, right? So when we uh, add a um, a Unicode uh, point, you know, whether it's one byte or two bytes for a Chinese character, um, then uh, is it decomposable, right? Uh, so many times we think of Chinese as being uh, radical based, right? So you have uso or something, right? Some some semantic characterization of what this character um, or concept is composed of, right? Uh, and if that's somehow encoded in the way that we fix Unicode points, then BPE will likely be able to recover that. Okay. Yes, uh, Shantay. Yeah. Just comment that um, there's, there's a package called CFR that does segmentation for Chinese. There are all like some like that. Like uh, uh, they're working with Chinese, like NLP for employees. I put it in a random chat. Okay. Thanks. So Jeba is another um, package. Yeah. So there are lots of uh, our Chinese scholars in China, HIT, for example, uh, who've worked on uh, Chinese word segmentation and subtoken uh, representation for quite a while. And uh, I think, again, it's sort of like English. Uh, we have the QWERTY keyboard. It's a disaster, but we use it anyways, even though it's not even close to optimal. And so that's a sort of the story with a lot of legacy decisions. Right, so um, our, our UTF uh, encodings for characters, they're not optimal. People have thought about it. And um, you know this is sort of the working solution right now. Okay, but a lot of things are like that. Uh, we were still using uh, a lot of legacy information from Unix, which is 1960s, right? There's a lot of things that we probably wouldn't do nowadays uh, that we still do because of uh, all the foundations built up. Right, I think you've seen the XK, uh, X, KCD uh, uh, cartoon where you know there's just this one sliver holding up this entire uh, framework of machine learning or whatever, um, and, and that's sort of like the state of, of uh, uh, a lot of things. But I think tokenization is not so bad. Okay, I think it's been thought about quite a bit. Okay, so let's thank Badvitya for his slide. Okay, and uh, we'll go on to our next uh, presenter. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Me so much for and Ravadia so much for the uh, first section. I'm going to proceed with the second section of um, distance supervision. Okay. Let me get a timer. You're seeing me uh, twice because uh, I'm with Wing, and our feature or bug is to present for the ties. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think distance revision is a very interesting topic. Um, the reason is that 
everything we, we learn for the model is either um, very next to the token or to the sentence, or we need human annotation. Distance provision sort of lies in the middle of it. Okay, so this is our agenda today. I'm first going to um, have a high level introduction, and then I'm covering two papers operationalized on the idea of distance supervision. Okay, so uh, let me first borrow on Yang Le Kun's uh, cake for his analogy of intelligence. Okay, so he said that our intelligence of the le learning is like uh, building a cake. Um, the, the 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 majority or the large part of the cake is the cake itself, right? And and he he said it it is the um, unsupervised or self supervised learning. So I in a context of our LLM course is obviously like mass language modeling, right? We use surrounding words to predict the central words without the the needing to annotate any data. And as for the supervised learning, he said it's the icing of the cake. It requires some human annotation. Okay, and it learns a, a learner to map from X to Y. And finally, he said that the reinforced learning is like the cherry because we need the environment and it will give the agents a reward um, when they get this action from the state. Okay, but it requires um, heavy interaction with the environment and it, it happens quite a few of time and it's only the cherry on the cake. Okay. So our question today is that can we add a, a layer to the cake? It's called distance supervision, which is lies in the middle of supervised learning and unsupervised learning. The idea is that we have some noisy data, but it is its quantity is, is way above the, the quantity of supervised learning. The reason is that you don't actually need any human annotation. We need some assumption and we can borrow the data and and we have a large amount of them, and we can train a model. Okay. So, um, so what is distance supervision? So, I'd like to give you guys a, a motivating example from on the task of relation extraction, which is a, a, a very classic task on before a transformer came along. So, let, let's consider there are two entities in the text, and there's a relation between them, like Kentridge is a place in. Singapore, where Kentridge is E1, Singapore E2, and R is, is a place in. So the um, formalization of the task is that in any task, we try to extract such um, entity pairs a given relation or predict the relation given to entity pairs. So the input before deep learning is some handcrafted features um, by, by computational linguistic, like we analyze the, the syntactic pattern between Kentridge and Singapore, maybe we'll say um, Kentridge is a place in Singapore or Kentridge located in the southern western part of Singapore. Okay? And we use this to um, um, train a learner. But the shortcoming is that um, we need human annotation okay, to create such a data set. For example, we have a so-called ACE data set, to, uh, a multilingual data to train such relation extractor. So in 2009, um, some very brilliant researchers from Stanford, they proposed a, a paper titled um, Distance Supervision for Relation Extraction Without Labeling. Okay. So this is the seminal work um, using distance supervision in NLP. Okay. So their uh, assumption is that, so on the above of this page, I draw the, the idea for the golden supervision is that we have this sentence and we have the entity pairs uh, annotated in them and we and we um, train the model to, to learn such pattern, okay? But it's shortcoming, this, the data is limited. The distance supervision means that um, we, we take a knowledge base and we have many entities, entity pairs inside us and they satisfy such relation, okay? And then they, they gather a large set of data that's which could be noisy. The, the, so how they gather data is like we have a pair of entity like New York and US, Shanghai and China, Kyoto and Japan, and they find many sentences containing these entity pairs. And they, it forms a huge amount of data, which could be noisy, but they still train a, train a model to classi classify this relation. And their central hypothesis is that um, 
even though it's noisy. But if the, the, the number is large, there's a um, useful pattern to learn from. It's like if our holes between E1 and E2, and any sentence containing E1 and E2 will probably express such R. So let's uh, read this example here. And I think uh, the page is a little bit off. Okay, um, let's move on a little bit. Okay, so our purpose is to learn the mapping or, or the pattern for um, the so, uh, E1 and E2, they satisfy the relation of a place in, okay? But the extracted distance supervision data is pretty noisy. So let's say that the two, the first two examples, they are valid. Okay, Shanghai is the economic center of China. Shanghai hosts the expo in China. So it's expressed the, 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 the relation of a place in, okay? But in China data three, it's not the case because China here expresses um, policy attributes. So it's the ceramic of China, not the, the, the country of China. Imported from Shanghai has the best quality. So it's not the case for the uh, relation R, but, um, but the author said that if we have a huge amount of data, even though it's noisy and our model can still learn the pattern from them. And ideally in a testing case, testing case the Kentridge holds Olympics in Singapore, which is kind of factual. And, but it still matches the pattern of the first training, uh, the, the second training example post in, right? And it can learn such pattern. Okay. And so let's recall the learning signal for large language models or not so large ones. We have the mass language model. Okay. We use the surrounding word to predict the mask word. We have the auto regressive model. We have um, a preceding words and we, uh, we have some existing words and we are predicting the next, okay. We have next, next sentence prediction. So what limitations do these signals have in common? Do you guys think? We have a chat. Uh, so yeah, um, you see on the previous paper. I use some um, denotation here. Okay? So the, um, the limitation is that everything comes from the exact same document, right? So they are pretty local. Like in the token prediction, all the tokens come from is a uh, surrounding context. And in the next sentence pre prediction, the next sentence come from is immediate context. And it not necessarily uh, relate to something that is far away from it and which might prevent the model from learning something more challenging, okay? So it comes to our research question today is that how to mine learning signals beyond its immediate context. Okay, and so in the following 10 minutes, I'm going to present solutions by two brilliant teams. So Michi from Stanford, he used um, link hyperlinks to mine distance signals and send them from the Ohio State University. He has been using um, a set of entities. Okay, so the thing here means persons, nations, days or years and, and foods and their entities to, to mine distant signals. So let's recall how we perform the next sentence prediction in birth model, okay? So it's the pretty standard um, next sentence pre prediction and every sentence is adjacent to each other, okay? And so Michi proposed that we can um, create new sentence pair by linking two documents together. And the way he performs so is by the hyperlinks in the documents like maybe say Wikipedia and every document or pages are linked together. Okay. So here S12 has been hyperlinked to S21, okay. from document one to document two, then every sentence in D1 and D2, they can potentially um, create a new sentence pair to be linked together as a, a new form of a sentence relation to predict, okay. So let me give you guys one very concrete example. On the left-hand side, doc one is our uh, university's uh, Wikipedia page. And we, we have an entity said um, can't reach, which ha has been hyperlinked to doc two, which is the can't reach um, Wikipedia page. And it says it's served by can't reach MRT station. Okay. So what can we tell from it? Okay. So 
it tells that our university is served by Cambridge MRT station. So by bridging two linked documents together, we can have some high order dependencies between the entities and, and the claims stated in each document, right? And so by, by asking the model to predict sentential relation in this way, we can enforcing it to do some uh, more challenging tasks, right? So, so let's imagine, right? So um, we're going to predict uh, NUS is a, a national university in Singapore. And the next sentence is, it is served by Kentridge MRT station. And when we're enforcing the model to link these two sentences together, it must implicitly build a bridge inside it, right? So it must um, maybe, I don't know, call its internal function to say, maybe uh, find the, 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 the specific location of NUS, right? And then um, it says it's Kentridge, then it could be served by an MRT. It means that the model, has to um, build something internally that's to bridge two things that are distant, okay, and 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 we can still be, build a bridge from it. Okay, so this is intuition for the paper. Clear? Okay. So if you're very clear about that, then the paper solution is pretty straightforward. So uh, it has a uh, added loss. The first loss is pretty standard. It's the mass function model, and second is so-called DRP. A document relation prediction. So um, it has three types of uh, relation to predict. The first is contiguous. It means that whether the two sentences are contiguous to each other, the same to next sentence prediction. We have the random, which we randomly sample a document and find a sentence from it. And the final one is the link. So, so it's the very similar to what we presented earlier as the, um, the, the uh, our university is served by Kentridge uh, MRT. So it's a three way classification. Oh, all right. So let's test our understanding. Uh, okay. So what if we remove the linked prediction in the uh, sentence pr uh, prediction task? Uh, which task will it be reduced to? If we just remove the third type of prediction, we only have the contiguous and random one. What will it be reduced to? a very passive learning objective. Yes, so it's just an SP, right? So, so it will be reduced to learning the next sentence prediction because the contiguous one is next sentence and random one is not, okay? And let's test our understanding again. So in the context of graph learning, so what is DPR modeling? What is MLM modeling? So in graph neural network, they have many types of prediction, like predicting the edge relation, predicting the node, predicting the graph labels. So what is our um, DPR modeling in the context of graph learning? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas, for the correct answer. So DPR stands for uh, edge prediction. Could you elaborate more? I mean, it's literally the links in documents. So if you have documents, then it's the link between them. Yes, so it's the edge between them. Okay, so what is the mass language modeling modeling in the context of graph learning? It should be the node prediction, right? So it's pre predicting the, the, the attributes of the node, right? So it's predicting what should be the, the word description of the node here, right? So um, I think we should continue for the interest of time. Okay, so um, I think um, Mitch's work is a very good example to um, find something that is not in the immediate context for the model to implicitly um, build a bridge to reason towards the next sentence. So, so why we still call it distance supervision? So my explanation is that, so even though two documents are hyperlinked, all right, but the two sentences, when they are sampled and to be put together, they are not necessarily linked in, in a very um, obvious way. So there might be cases that the two sentences, they, they, they don't have a certain relation. So, so we call it distance supervision, it's not perfect. And so our question now is that, so can we explicitly train a model to extract an answer from a given context? And to 
answer this question. And so let's pr um, proceed to the second paper I'm going to present today. I'm going to only cover it. Um, it's my idea for the interest of time. And so that and the paper is titled Reason Birds, Pre-trained um, pre to Reason with Distant Supervision. So, so let's directly go to its uh, modeling part. Okay. So um, it says, given any sentence, we're going to select two pairs of entities from it. And from sentence one containing um, entity A and B and sentence two containing entity C and D, and, and where S1 and S2, they might, they might not come from the same document with S, okay? And so the, the learning here is that we mask the entities from the original sentence and, and we and we ask the model to retrieve the answer from the evidence sentence one or the evidence sentence two. Oh, so in this document, if we mask the beach soccer and 1998, so what it requires the model to retrieve from the evidence one and evidence two. If we mask um, on beach soccer else and 90, 98 hours, what it required for it to, 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 to um, recover um, or extract those tokens from evidence one and evidence two. What do you guys think? So by by like by like pulling on surrounding words, right? You're able to get a topic of what is the thing to be covered to. Sure. Okay, and um, thank you, Warren, for his answer. And um, yeah, I think um, um Warren is um giving a correct answer. So it means that we try to map things together, like so uh so, so in this case, if we mask beach, uh, soccer, and 1998, so it means the, the green things here are still available, right? So it must um, try to align the, the uh, Euro Beach Soccer League EBSL here with the, the, the green token here together. So they're aligned and they can use it as an sort of anchor, okay, to look for the answer. And the answer should be um, um, beach soccer, okay? So by essence, if we mask these two token outs, it is performing two single hop QA because um, the, the, the two QA is not quite um, intersected, right? For example, when we are retrieving um, 1998 from the second evidence, we don't, necess we don't necessarily need evidence from the first uh, answer, right? So, which is speech soccer. So do you think it's still the case for Q2? Um, if we mask um, EBSL out simultaneously, um, what it is required to um, recover it. So anyone else want to give an answer? Can we simulate the thinking in our human's mind? So if we are going to um, do this task, what shall we do? This uh, competition. Uh, okay. So 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 what's my name again? What's the name? Okay. So so what Helen said that we should maybe look for the keyword of competition. Right. I guess the and the thing here is that we're sort of looking for something as um, co-reference or something as a bridge. The model it should has a so the feeling that the, the two blanks here are probably referring to the same thing as the soccer league, right? And then, so it is a competition in beach soccer and it is simultaneously related to the timestamp time of 1998. And when it has such two things in mind together, it can solve the question together. So it's the so-called bridging question in the multi-hop QA setting. So apparently to the answer is that Q2 is more challenging because um, Q1 is two single hop QA, but Q2 is one multi-hop QA. It needs to link things together. Okay, so 
I'd like to uh, link this paper back to our very first uh, announcement for, for the distance supervision is that um, its assumption still holds, right? So when it retrieves the evidence from a web corpora or, or database or anything, and the assumption still holds is that um, the relation between A and B in S1 is still likely to be the same in, in the original sentence. But this might not be the case because we, we don't really um, qualify the, the, the evidence. We're just saying the evidence is here and their, their pattern might probably be there and we just use it as additional evidence for the model to reason upon so that uh, it has a, a, a additional resource for its training, right? So the um, assumption for distance supervision still holds. And so I only um, present two pieces of uh, performance um, uh, screenshots from the paper because obviously they, they all show improvements. So um, the authors, they both highlight that and their models are performing especially well in the context of multi-hop QA. Um, do you guys have any conjecture why? So, so why do you think they perform especially well for multi-hop QA? Okay. Yeah, so what's your name again? So Jason said that they are trying to find a bridge between text, right? Okay, great. So, so my answer is that, right? So for example, in the link birds, when they are predicting the third relation, which is the two sentences are linked in some way, but not directly contiguous, it means that it must build an implicit bridge um, inside this model to um, link to, um, two statements together implicitly by building a bridge. Okay, I think we are still on time. So let's wrap up this session. So distance supervision is what? So it's a mechanism to provide a large amount of useful data, even though it could be noisy. So we've introduced two works. So Michi used the hyperlinks and, and Xiang used um, entities to serve as anchors to look for distance supervision. So my takeaway for you guys is that to encourage you guys to think about what other anchors you can think of to use to, to create distance supervision for large language models. Okay. Any questions from you guys, please? Hi, okay, so yeah. um, just to recap, distance supervision is like something like a training class, right? Similar to like the unsupervised training class or yeah. like sentence prediction or last language model. Yeah. So, um, how is this like implemented in practice? Because um, mm -hmm. going back to like earlier slide where you showed mm -hmm. what, what you show uh, distance provision is like having a AB pair and a bunch of noisy data that gives information about that pair. Like what's the task here? Sure. Okay. So um um distance supervision could be a sort of abstract notion. Mm -hmm. So in the um classic um Machine learning, all right. Okay. So um, my understanding is that it is in the intermediate between supervised and unsupervised learning. So it is still trained in some way. Maybe it could it could still be trained in a supervised way. It's only that its training data set is much larger and and it's um but still trained in the same fashion. Okay. And the data set is larger, but it's more noisy. So this is in the area of supervised learning, okay? But the actual implementation is a little bit different in the area of large language modeling or, or the current learning. For example, in Xiang's work, right? So you're asking how we actually um, operationalize the distance supervision. So my, answer, my short answer is that the evidence pair we used here are the distance supervision but the actual learning is still performed in a supervised style because they are supervised to extract the answer from this evidence. So why we call it distant, the, the distant means that the evidence, uh, the evidence for it to reason upon might not be the correct evidence. It might be a noise evidence. So it's why we call it distance revision. But it's still, I, I think for me, it's a pretty uh, supervised work.
have to answer a question. To summarize, it's basically this supervision is something like a class of um, learning objectives similar to supervised learning and yeah. supervised learning. And like the individual task may vary based on simulation. Yes, yeah, very on different tasks. So for me, it's only that the data is large and noisy, but the actual implementation is still the same. Like for example, it's still learning the extractive QA, which is pretty standard of supervised learning. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think this is an important point. So does anyone else want to add to it? What, what is distance supervision? I guess we're going to have that on Kahoot next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, like Yi Song said, distance supervision is a technical term in machine learning, right? So it, it actually has a, a specific meaning. So you can look it up on Wikipedia, right? So distance supervision means, again, using another task that could align with your original task, okay? But the labels that are given are not gold standard labels. Like, uh, what Yi Song was pointing out with the, uh, I think, uh, located in uh, case, right? When we get uh, samples of that data, they're not always correct, right? There was a, a case where that is wrong, right? So even though it says here training free, you know, the, the system is trained on that, okay? It thinks this is correct because uh, we're giving this assumption of distance supervision being a task that correlates with the original task but that the labels are not bought up, uh, not given by a gold standard labeler, right? We, we go through a process of assuming that any data that meets the particular assumption that's like on this slide here is a correct one, right? So it's some sort of self-supervision, you can say. You know, we use a assumption to acquire data and that uh, acquired data is used to train a model. That model could be aligned with the original task, okay? Yeah, uh, so there's another thing uh, I think you may get confused in this particular example is that distance could mean distant from the context or the context window of a transformer, right? So when we say, you know, a context window has, you know, how many tokens in it, and uh, Yi Song is saying, well, reach beyond the document. So I reach outside of that document and I find a distant link, you know, through a hyperlink or through an entity. Uh, the technical thing for distance supervision does not connote that, right? So I think in, in this particular case, when we're thinking about distant uh, supervision, it's sort of overloaded, right? You could think about distance in terms of having weak labels, which is what it means technically, but you could also think about distant meaning outside of the context window of a transformer, right? Which is, you know, we can model things within the context window pretty easily, right? We just, uh, have it within the uh, matrix multiply all of the linear algebra parts, right? To, to look at things within the attention window. But if you go outside of that uh, and you want to bring long context into play, then uh, something like bridging across documents or bridging through entities to find other contexts that are outside, that's also something uh, that uh, is, being in, um, is being iterated on in this way. Does that help? Other questions? Please. Uh, yeah, uh, before I ask, yeah, uh, I just want to uh, comment on, uh, like, I, I think I think they were really a uh, good try on paper. I think, I think Thank you. Really yeah. uh, I want to ask about, like, um, have you read about follow any follow up works or uh, like at least the first paper or something? Because, like, I mean, like, my next guess is, uh, I mean, like, given that the first paper work, my my next best guess is if we kind of zoom up and want to generalize, right? We can sort of view the first word as first word as like uh using the signal of uh documents with a distance of one as a signal, then we generate more. what what about uh documents related with uh like you know up slightly longer distance of so, like like if if you you have three documents. Uh, document one and three, they are related by, uh, by like, say, two hops. It's still a signal, and it's still a parameter that you can maybe sort of tweak to fit into the dots. And it's, it's still useful in information that you are two hops away compared to, say, two documents that are 10 hops away, then you can probably guess they are not that related. But it's, it's still useful signal in the sense that, like, 
I mean, we have contrast machine learning, but that's what we want to do, right? That, that takes code together and things for that. I, I, I don't know if uh, have they tried any more extensions that generalize like this kind of, um, I guess, graph properties like, like distance uh, or something. Yeah, so it, it seems really useful. And at the same time, it helps capture this, like, you know, the, like, like let's say Wikipedia, for example, all, all the links linking the, the documents together it's actually like really useful like like graphical information that, that you don't almost always like like people are trying to do graph ml and try to put these things together and stuff yeah. thank you for your comments yeah i i haven't really um done the um backward forward or the backward tracing of the, the paper I'm sorry for that yeah. So let me add a little bit here. So I think the question is, can you do more? Can you do propagation, right? Can you do propagation, say, okay, if I know there's some signal when I go from one hop to one hop, then can I do it again and use two hop? And if that still provides signal, can I go to the third hop, right? And so um, this type of idea has been done many times. In fact, when you look at the original week's uh, supervision, often what they do is they take uh, things that are confidently uh, predicted as true and then add them to the training data and then try again. So you can think of this also as related to um, uh, boosting. So we know the machine learning algorithm of boosting, you have a bunch of weak classifiers like a decision stump and you just add them all together and you get something like beta boost, okay, which means that I have lots of really simple but stupid things working together and then they finally get to get a good ensemble right um, so that's one part so you can iterate uh, on a single hop multiple times and then get something that's still a single hop but better than if you aggregated it all together the other part that you asked about is doing multi-hop so even in something like a convolutional model when we're doing convolutional graph learning often you're trying to characterize a node in a graph by its position with respect to its neighbors, right? So you say, this node is connected to these five other nodes. So when I characterize this node, I'm gonna use some context from the other five nodes to characterize it, right? So let's say I, I have a new uh, product. I don't know how to characterize it, but I know uh, people who buy that product also buy you know, uh, fitness food or other things of this sort. So I'm going to invoke information about who buy those other products to, um, characterize this product, right? And you can, again, hop that out. You can say, uh, instead of choosing one hop, I can use multiple hops, right? So I take a neighborhood around an, an item in a node or a step, and then uh, try to replicate that. So that's, I think, what you're suggesting. So I think the key thing here is when you're talking about all of these self-supervised or weak supervision, is that you want to make sure that whatever step you're incorporating, you get enough signal and not a lot of noise, right? Every time you go another hop distance, there's usually another exponent of data more that you can incorporate, right? Like when you go from a language model of one gram, you have V vocabulary words. But if you go to two gram, you have V squared, right? And, and then if you go to, uh, uh, sorry, is that right? Uh, yeah. And then when you go to a, a third step, it'll be V cubed, right? So because of that exponential growth in steps, uh, every time you increase one step size, you have uh, V more or N more neighbors that you have to consider, then it usually uh, peters out very fast, meaning you, you just don't get enough signal after a while. You know, there'll be some cases that are good, like you can say some two hop or three hop cases are good, but many times there's very hard to discriminate which ones are good. Okay, let's thank our speaker. So our next presenter. Okay, uh, uh, I'll try to make my part as soon as possible since we still have two friends. And um, okay, my section is uh, today I'm going to talk sparse attention mechanism for long sequence modeling. So uh, as we know, uh, the long, 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 long distance dependency 
uh, is a key challenge for both computer vision and natural language processing and traditional uh, uh, deep learning networks such as uh, RNN, uh, it suffers from uh, vanishing gradient and convolution neural network. It has uh, it only have a local receptive field in each layer. So, um, to, uh, so uh, for uh, traditional trans transformer models, which have uh, quadratic uh, complexity in terms of uh, memory and computation, uh, which all, uh, it often limits the input sequence length to 512. So uh, it, it, it prevents transformers from, pre, uh, from being applied to uh, tasks which require much longer context, uh, much longer input sequence, like uh, uh, question answering or long document classification, long document summarization. And yes, even for GPT-4, we still need much longer context to uh, for prompt or few shorts. So, uh, why, why, why this area is valuable because you can see even uh, for GPT-4, we also need to pay, uh, it, it only have two, two versions. One, uh, GPT-4 can handle uh, 8,000 tokens and 30, 32,000 tokens. And we have to pay for much longer context, uh, for much longer generation and input. So uh, should, uh, as, so we already have a very detailed illustration of self-attention. I just give you uh, an example here. So for input sequence, we when we calculate the attention score is uh, n square, and this is very expensive. So what can we do with? Uh, I'll give you a basic overview uh, how how uh, uh, basic overview of different solutions in this area, and then we will focus more on sparse attention. So uh, one way to do that is like what if what if we calculate the key value pair first, and this this operation this metric of operation uh, reduce the reduce the complexity from n square to n to linear n. But what's the answer of this? The, so you can see actually we already so uh, from the uh, from the results we can see that even we uh, even uh, the the operation is much faster now, but the perplexity actually, the performance actually, uh, actually um, become worse. And what can we bring back the non-linearity will be linear? Yes, we, we can do this. And yeah, Google in in the same year, it actually use, uh, it, it, we, we actually introduce additional uh, functions. They, they call this random future map and it's, oh, in end this as uh, kernelizable softmax, and after we have this function, uh, after we have these functions, we we actually bring back the non-linearity will be linear. And in the same year, so so what if we we just want to keep our original uh, attention calculation? What can we do is that uh, I I use two additional projections to project key and value. From n uh, r times, so you can see here the key here is r times n. What if I use additional projection to project this r times n to r times k? R, r times k. So in in this way, actually we are, we we can reduce this uh this uh calculation from oh, n square times r to n times k times r. And uh, yeah, similarly we we project this to we we do the same projection for value. And by this way, we actually we can also reduce the complexity to linear. And another, another so this is the, one of the main branch, and we modify attention to make it work for long, longer context. And another way to do this is that remember for natural language processing, uh, for a uh, sequence input, uh, especially uh, for let, let's say we for document input, we generally have all have sentence have document. So what if we model it level by level, right? So if, if I have an, an input sequence, uh, um, um input tokens, uh, I calculate local attention first. Let's say we, we calculate a representation of uh, a local a local sentences. So this would re reduce the the um tokens to LO, LO sentences. And further, we use a, additional attention mechanism to calculate on, uh, to calculate document representation based on these LO sentences. So in this way, we actually reduce the M square complexity to uh, L, L, 
to KL uh, to L uh, to L L times yards. Uh, so here by this way we calculate a uh, a local a local uh, tension. So this this steps it will be like if we have t words in in one sentences, this step will have uh, a lot times t squared uh, t square, and we have a lot sentences. It will be a lot times t square. And in 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 this layer, we only need to calculate a lot square attention. So by this way, we actually reduce the quadratic complexity. So uh, uh, let's go back to uh, long document modeling. So in this area, there are two uh, benchmark in. Uh, one is a uh, long range arena. So this, this data set actually have ranges from 1000 token to 60,000 token. And it, it covers uh, like images and text. And also it need to, it also need to challenge the model uh, in understanding the structure and some spatial uh, relations. And you, you can see here actually for lean former or performer like we, we introduced previous, and uh, you actually can can yeah speed up a little bit speed up, but actually you cannot achieve the same performance as a um, traditional transformer because and um, yeah so we we, we will introduce uh, Big Bird uh, today. So why why Big Bird can uh, can achieve better performance where you you using sparse attention, and later I will also uh, give a um, basic introduction about ROM T five model. So uh, let's, uh, so if we consider the uh, full step attention as a complete uh, graph, so do we, a natural question appear is that do we need all these edges? Can we remove some edges while keeping, uh, so, so that we can make it fa uh, compute faster and while maintaining, uh, try to make the model, uh, mo mo the representation as uh, expressive as possible, yes. So one way to do this is that we calculate local attention. So by 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 this sliding windows, we only make each query attends to its neighbors. So uh, how this works is that, uh, so it, let, let's say for the node here, it will only attends to its neighbors. But when we have when we have much more layers, new neural network layers, we can attend much longer. Yeah, but uh, we. When we have more, so the 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 reception the reception field will be much like a triangle here. When when we have more layers, we can attend to more tokens and try to uh, build the relations between uh between these distant tokens and and not so. Uh, so generally, this local attention uh this signing window is not enough because we cannot. Or keep increasing the uh, network layers. Uh, so can we add more? Add just a uh, finite edges and uh, make and uh, make this representation more expressive. Yes. And so we can just so as you can see here, we ask we just add some random random edges here. So you can see if if previously if this nodes wants to attend this uh this distant nodes, it need to go through several edges, but what if we add this random uh, random uh, edges here? You, you, so yeah, actually this random attention allows more pairs to uh, to talk, to communicate with each other. So, uh, but this random plus uh, this sending window is not enough. So you can see here, compared to bird based model, it actually, it actually still means something. So what's, What's missed here is that we need some global connections to connect these local uh to to connect these local patterns. And, and in, in the original paper, actually Big say that we, we need at least one global tokens. The reason is that so suppose we have two doc, two documents and this sparse attention makes so attempts to the same words, but actually these two documents are different. So we we want the model to output different uh, to output different uh, representation for these two different documents, but the sparse attention will only attend to some specific tokens. But these specific tokens are the same. So in, in this way, if we have some global tokens which make make this fast, 
different because these two, two documents actually they are different. So this is a very intuitive uh, explanation for why we need global tokens. And um, in the original paper, they actually call this uh, a call this sparse attention as a uh, universal approximator and Google give a very um, solid proof. So here we combine these three attention patterns together, we get big bar. And um, if we re remove this gender attention, what we have is long form. And generally, so now we reduce this capacity from N square to, uh, to, uh, to linear. So in, as you can see here, so each each query, each each input tokens will only attend to some random to some random tokens in the same row, and also its neighbors, and also we need to uh, so in this way we need to print define which tokens are global tokens, right? And by by this way we actually can customize uh, uh, different attention patterns for different tasks. But, but yes, yeah, so, so linear is good, sparse is good. So uh, is this sparse attention the final answer for long document modeling? Of course not. So if you see carefully, actually in previous slides, uh, you can see even Big Bird have um, uh, achieved much better performance, but actually the fit is just, uh, just like an original transformer. Why? Even it has this OKN because the K here, we, 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 uh, the, so it, it is not as good as the features show here. The K used in both Big Bird and Long Former actually is 512. So it's not a very small, so it's not a very small number. But yeah, we, 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 we need to admit that both Big Bird and Long Former, it makes a uh, transformer model to, uh, for much longer context. And Big Bird and Long Former, can have 4,000 tokens as input, but in it generally, we, we generally, it, these two models generally did not speak up very, um, speak up. so another way to do this is that we have a more efficient way to calculate, uh, to, to get this long document representation. Uh, yes, uh, so an, an hour way to calculate these global tokens. Remember for previous like big bar uh, and long format, we need to predefine which, which tokens are global tokens. Now, what if we can calculate these global tokens much faster? So here, what they did uh, by uh, Google in, in last year is that we have, so we keep, we keep the sliding windows, but in, uh, so here we need to split the input input tokens into several blocks. And like, let's say we have k k blocks. Then each blocks I just use a simple summing, simple averaging to get the global tokens. So when when the document input is different, these global tokens is different. So I just calculate these global tokens. They call this transient global tokens. By this way, we use the so. Uh, each query here will attend to its neighbors, but also attends to the, this uh, calculated global tokens. And this is a much efficient way to do this. Uh, so in, in this way, we do not need additional uh, uh, predefined uh, pre index or this additional index to specify which, which tokens are global tokens. Okay. Yeah, so LongNet just, just proposed in several months, uh, in several months ago, what, what, what they did is that they make, uh, so Microsoft research actually make this, this fast attention more um, consistent with the code only structure. So uh, what they did is that they use, use uh, window, they use window. So we, as you can see here, they also, you, they, for a sequence input, they split into different windows and we only, we only, Calculate the local attention inside this inside each windows and uh, so of course if 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 uh, so if we can we we only use this uh, local attention is not enough right so here what they did is that they actually use a dilation rate so uh, the dilation rate here uh, dilation rate is one here so we just 
so each 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 token inside each inside. So the first tokens will only assign to first token, and the second token will att attach to itself, and also uh its previous token. But in here, the dietary uh, we have uh, when we increase the dietary, we actually we will skip the second queries. So in this way, we we are not just project, or we we are not just specify specify the query, uh, the key and value. We also uh, specify the query. Yeah, so uh, what long neck can do is that it actually uh, extend. And so it, it actually extend. So it makes the transformer can process much longer uh, tokens. They say, this, uh, they say they can process one billion tokens, but actually, they can only uh, they, they they did not really train on one billion tokens because yeah but they they prov uh, they provide a solution to do this is that they uh in the original paper uh, if, even though now you have linear capacity but you want to process this one billion tokens at one time it's impossible right so what they did is that they split this one billion tokens into several blocks and different blocks can be processed by different GPUs and these GPUs share key and value but and they use all gathers to get this key value uh, and make sure this query can be computed in low in a local way. Uh, yes so by this way they can process much longer uh, tokens and yeah okay uh, uh, yesterday uh, Marcus also suggested me to uh, introduce this partitional in, in uh, I, I don't think we have enough time. I uh, give its reference. Uh, yeah. So if you are interested in this part, uh, um, I'm, yeah, you can discuss with me. Uh, do we have any questions? Maybe have a quick one. Start. How was the global token determined? Could you elaborate more? Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, here, how to uh, so generally for bigger, bigger and long form, uh, how to define this global tokens? Yeah. Like this, this global tokens. Uh, let's say, remember we have uh we have an input sequence. We just make specific uh the uh we we just tell the model in in advance that say that oh now this this token is a global tokens and all 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 queries later will need to attach to this global tokens. Yeah. So it's a fixed pattern, but it, it, this global tokens and random tokens will be different from layer by layer, and also different, different in different head multiple heads. Yes. They're still random, but not so sort of heuristic as prior. Yes. Okay. Understood. Uh, I so so I think there are then they have some work that they. Uh, that they decide the tokens by like maximizing the uh, user information in the remaining tokens. Um, so, I think, uh, so people already use it in mostly like which token they have to use it in inside the token. It's not very strange. Thanks. So, uh, actually, that's what question. So, um, so this seems not a long, uh, a long network. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Quite, quite a number of applications. When it will be like even if. Uh, you increase the average of this, yes. then uh, the number of tokens that will then during that it will still the same one. Uh, because let's say here I count when you increase the average of the rate to two, then yeah. one, two, three, four, five, and so still then, still then squares are using to cut them. So kind of like even if you increase the mm -hmm. the number of squares to square then will be still the same if I might correct. Um 
So uh, for long net, what they did is that we split the input tokens into uh, by uh, into different uh, windows. And so we actually split the the whole input sequence into different segments, and each segment only calculate the local attention. But here, when we increase the dilated rate here, remember previous long form and uh, big world. So we 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 still need to go through the the whole input sequence one by one, right? But here we just skip, we just so we the first token still attends to itself. Uh, but when we calculate the second token, so we calculate the attention scores, we just skip it, skip it. And then in the the, the third tokens will only attend to itself and also the first tokens. By this way, we actually Yes, we reduce we reduce the num the the number of calculation in each step. Yeah. So what did we start the total number of tokens that people use and did they attach to still the same or different method to waste? Uh, yes, so we, we need to make sure that this this segment length uh the ratio between this segment length yeah. and that ratio should be yeah, a constant. So it means that the first token every attempt, like always attempt with a limited token. But some tokens mm -hmm. always meets when the length of the bridge increase. Right? So like the second one. The second one. So I think they're giving a trade-off, right? They're saying that uh, for the immediate window, use fewer tokens, right? You're going to get the reserve of the tokens uh, for longer range, right? And for each longer range, you back off to a longer, a larger dilation rate, a larger dilation, but fewer tokens, right? So you aggregate this over several transformer layers, and then you can scale out somewhat like what you do dilation with a convolutional neural network, right? You do um, stacking of convolutional layer networks, then you have a larger receptive uh, field, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, I, uh, so my point was that some token would be kind of like never that do the um, other tokens globally when the level of the bridge increase. For example, the second token in the, in the vertical, the first vertical, the second token from the top to the bottom, they would never be attempt to the um, other tokens when they the break to or or even more. Right? Well, yeah. they're caught on this the the blue triangle, right? You you always have at least the, every token attending within one of the blue yeah, triangle ranges. In that one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it, it, it needs to be propagated up, right? So that uh, anything in the blue triangle needs to be propagated to uh, some some context, some sum in the green, one of the green dots, right? And then all the orange dots are, are attending to some of the things within a green dot. So you're losing a lot of representation as you go up, right? But the point is that some of the signal from each one can, can propagate forward, yeah. Yeah, and also another idea is that on the local blocks, right? So as you like swim upstream with blocks, you hope that maybe um, the necessary information might get like moved and between like um the different like two areas. So then eventually like the last open sequence can implicitly attend to the first open sequence, but only because the first open sequence is like is like hashed somewhere in like the n minus bit. And they, in the original paper, they actually proved that. Uh, so in in any input uh sequence like with with uh in any input like we have an n sequence input, the distance between two two tokens is log log a n. Yeah. So they actually proved this they, to say that yes, uh when we have enough layers, actually two uh two tokens even they are very far from each other or they they uh they just not attend or be be dilated so but they still can attend to each other. Yeah, we just need log a and yeah. Okay. Um in the interest of time, I think uh we'll let our uh, thank our presenter first. And I think uh there was we have two more speakers, is that right? Marcus. 
right. Um, okay, cool. So um, you guys are going to do your project soon, right? And obviously, when we're doing projects, we cannot pre chain GP3 or GP4. We do not have $100 billion to spend, okay, $10 billion to spend, right? So today I'm going to talk about how you can do smaller models using higher quality data or using less RAM or just any sort of the above heuristics, right? Um, first is data. Um, GPT3 commonly trades on what's common crawl, right? Which is a large portion of the internet it takes in Reddit for common knowledge. It takes in GitHub for code. It takes in um, like Wikipedia library genesis for books, right? Um, and it turns out that common crawl is a mess. There are tons of um, gibberish data that's in there. Um, logic that doesn't make sense, shit posts on 4chan, um, and like SHA-256 hashes in crypto that are completely impossible to predict and just make the perplexity go like infinite, not infinite, very high. Um, so even when you try to filter it out, right, you cannot filter out, you can maybe you can filter out like the SHA-256 hashes if it looks like it doesn't make sense, like you can filter that out, right? But things that are like, like illogical statements, you know, like, um, lies and bad facts. You cannot filter those out, right? You have 300 billion tokens. That's like maybe a thousand times of Wikipedia. You cannot filter that out. So how do you get high quality data, right? Um, most recently, it's, well, the, the trend these days is to just use ChatGPT. And so you can see here that um, this is the generation for GP2, which is a 1.5 billion parameter model. And okay, Jane takes a soup full of soup, but then she makes a thing. The soup is too old. Tom scowl. That doesn't make sense. That's not this like how can a soup be too old, right? Um, and then it quickly evolves. Whereas if you take a 28 million parameter model, mind you, which is about maybe 20, 50 times smaller, it is actually logical. The soup is very bitter. She does not like it. She said, I don't like this soup, it's too bitter. Um, is sorry, right? It has a nice ending and it's even like a happy ending, like a nursery story, right? And how is it actually doing that? Um, yeah, and we can have more examples. Um, like, let's say, Paul was so tired, Alice was so tired when she got back home, so she went outside, there's a GPU situation. If she's tired, why don't you go outside? No, she wants to sleep, right? Doesn't make sense, okay. Now, Lily likes cats and dogs. She asked her mom for her dogs, and her mom said no. So instead, she asked her dad. They bought her a chihuahua, and she took to them immediately. It, it's like, kind of, but not really, right? And you look at, like, let's say, uh, the stories, the completion for a tiny story. So she asked her mom again, yeah, okay? So she asked her dad for a cat. Um, okay, fine, ask a different person figure, right? And it's pretty clear that, like, um, not quantitatively, but qualitatively, that these GP2 um, completions are almost up par, or even sometimes worse <laughs> than the um, completions of a model 20 times smaller. Um, you can kind of give a hand wavy intuition that it's like um, data diet, right? If, you're, if your model is fed on a poor diet, um, Reddit, GitHub, Common Crawl data, then it's like bad quality. A lot of it's repetitive. You're not learning stuff. It gets confused, right? It's like junk. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of signal in it, definitely, and that's where GPT four I guess is like advanced logic. But you need to like elicit that out through like advanced fine tuning and RLHF, right? And we don't have those resources. Okay. So another way is to just give it clean data from the start, right? Which is what you can achieve with ChatGPT and GPT-4. But then you ask me, wait a minute, um, synthetic data in the past generally hasn't worked, right? You take, let's say, what's called data augmentation in images, right? You flip it, you rotate it, you give it different colors, right? You put it black and white, you scale it, you distort it, whatever, right? Because there's only so many permutations in which you can like, do all that stuff, do all that data mangling before it's like, okay, you're learning kind of the same thing over and over again. And so like, what's the answer? Well. 
again, this is for your projects if you want to do it. There are like some tricks, right? You could say, like, given a vocabulary of 1500 words that a three year old child might understand, you know, like home, Sally, Alice, sugar, soup, sad, right? Those words, you sample three words from it, okay, and you put it in the prompt. The instruction. This was how they built all the kinds of stories they would say. Right? They, they should use these three words. Right? They should have a bad end. And then these three words are key enough that it generates more or less a new story at the time. Right? And if you do uh, 1500 select three, that's about a million permutations, which is more than enough for diversity, at least for nursery stories, right? Okay, and here's another cool thing that you get with clean data. When you have clean data, you have clean mechanistic interpretability. What is mechanistic interpretability? It's, right, it's like, it's a very new idea um, where you try to analyze um, the neurons, the nodes in the MLP feed forward layer of the attention block. So you have like, um, you have like a block. Right, which is um, attention is here, self attention, right, for the decoder, and then you have the MLP block, right, and then it goes like that, right. So there's some like nodes like in the MLP block, and then you can measure their activations. And maybe it might tell you that, hey, these nodes are actually doing something that is meaningful to us, that is interpretable to us. It kind of makes sense, right? You look at like the red words. Okay, what do all these highlight? They highlight the subject of the sentence, right? Over here, what does it highlight? It highlights the verbs, right? Ran, push, pull, come. Here are names, Amy, Sue, Tim, right? Adjectives, mean, delicious, big, new, scary. Like, um, they're, like, it's clearly, like, trying to delineate between um, different neurons, like, each of the neurons are serving different functions, different purposes, which is kind of like the pipe dream of most ML researchers that like, I mean, that's like confusing and we don't understand it, right? And then you contrast it to GPT-2, where it's like, okay, it kind of works, but like, not really, because here it's like, maybe why dinosaurs, okay, it's adjectives and nouns, and here it's like verbs and adjectives, like they're kind of there, but it's, not so much, right? Of course, you have to caveat all this because these were cherry picked from like millions of neurons, but it's still cool that like if you pick the best one, like at least there's some hope that it might work, right? Uh, Marcus, can yeah. you use the laser pointer and then uh, I mean uh, on the laptop, just press L. Uh, yeah. How do I? The, the button L, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, then it'll show up on both screens and on the recording too. Okay, sure, no worries. Um, yeah, and then this is not an isolated paper, right? Both papers, funnily enough, are published by Microsoft, the same people who fund OpenAI. So I don't know why, um, but <laughs> you guys can rumor amongst yourselves. Um, uh, that's on the recording, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I did not state any facts. I just offered suggestions. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right, the second model is called Phi-1. It's... 100 times bigger, 1.5 billion parameters, but far smaller than ChatGBT. Um, yeah, wait, hold on. Did I? Someone moved my slides. Wait, sorry, can I, can I restart this? Um, that's weird. Okay, anyways, sorry about that. Yeah, so, you have Phi-1, which is 100 times smaller than ChatGPT. And then you can see the kind of like the similar formula, right? Where you um, teach a model using a data set that kind of like as if you're teaching a college student at NUS, right? Um, and then you scale that data set size, that textbook size um, using GPT-4 synthetic data. And then you can see it mirrored here again. It's the same formula, right? Instead of, this is what um, L, okay. This is what you would get from GitHub, right? It's like messy spaghetti GitHub code. It's just doing the same initialization over and over and over again, right? If I give this to like a first year at NUS, like this doesn't, this doesn't teach them much, 
right? Whereas on the left over here, this is like how you would teach the freshman. You know, it's like good annotations, good doc strings, every line serves a purpose, right? It's succinct, it's clear. It's like, it follows all the best software engineering principles, right? And this is the sort of stuff that incidentally also works really well for um, like this model phi one, right? And the results kind of show themselves. Um, it, well, it, is 51% versus ChatGPT at 47%. So just for this limited task of Python code completion, it can actually outperform ChatGPT and it's not that far off from GP4, which is pretty amazing given how small it is, right? Um, and of course, again, there are caveats. You can only do this in Python. If I moved it to JavaScript or C or any other like abstract language, like it wouldn't, but come on, like, <laughs> it's still pretty amazing, right? Okay, um, now to pivot, my second topic is quantization, right? First it was data, now quantization. Quantization is what you represent um, every number in the parameter from floating point to something that's a bit more compressed. Um, you convert um, the input, which is usually um, 32 bit floating point on the real number spectrum. So continuous, right? Anywhere from negative infinity to infinity, kind of. Um, and then you output it to um, int eight, which, it, which is um, two to the eight possibilities, right? So you're mapping a continuous distribution of weights to one that's discrete, linearly spaced quanta. If you want to know why it's called quantization, because back in um, quantum physics, you had this thing called quanta, where you had like, it's like discrete things. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and looking at this, um, yeah, looking at this formula here, you can see it's like you take something continuous and you split it up into chunks that are literally spaced. Right. And then you ask me how you do it. This is how you, it's, it's actually really simple and kind of dumb. Um, it's, you take a conversion factor, right. Which is C, which is the biggest of um, your input, your the biggest of your output to the biggest of your input, and then you multiply it by your original number. So it's like, let's say, um, let's say you had like your the biggest in. Yeah, you can you can work this out if it's like the biggest max b is like. Um, if max b is 127, because the integer range um, is frequently between negative 127 to 127, um, then this becomes 127, let's say the biggest of your um, original floating point weights was 1270, right? And then you wanted to convert um, 10, right? Then this becomes what? like what, right? You're just scaling it. It's, it's a scale factor, okay? And this very simple thing is what allows all these viral posts on Twitter where you can run like state-of-the-art models like Llama 2 on your laptop or even on, on a Raspberry Pi, yeah. right? Which is <clears throat> kind of insane. No, no one expected this, okay? There are a few nuances. Um, like if you take, yeah, floating point 32 um, is four bytes per token, right? Which means it's 28 gigabytes of RAM. And then you convert it down into an eight, which is seven gigabytes of RAM, which is um, all of you guys have seven gigabytes of RAM. You can run this on your local machine, right? And of course, like there are some things to think about, like what I was describing before, we have one scaling factor, one conversion factor. You could have it for the entire model. Right, you could sample. You could have the entire model of seven billion parameters, seven billion weights be the distribution, or you could have it per block. You could say I have a different conversion factor for every single block, and then between blocks, I would have to convert back to floating point and then into quantization. Right. So um, there are pros and cons to each of those. The pro, um, well, okay, the con for um, converting the whole model is that you get a lot, a lot of outliers. Right. Um, and the con for converting per block is that 
you have a, a slight performance hit because you have to convert in and out because it's on different conversion factors. It's on different scale factors. Okay. Um, and okay, more variants. Um, there's this thing called four bit normal flow, right? Where it's like, um, let's take a very extreme distribution, okay? Where you have like this, right? Um, what int eight would do is it would say, here's the max, right? And here's the min, okay? I would space it linearly 128 of this, like that. Right, so this might have what 0.0001% of area. This might have what like 49% of area, right? And it's <laughs> there's there's clearly some very high error error going on here, right? Instead, what you could do is you could say you could split it up by area, right? Which then in that case you would get something like from here to here might be like 25%, 25%, 25%, 25 right? So it becomes a much more representative. And then you can prove that if um, this distribution is indeed a normal distribution, um, it becomes optimal in the information theory um, sense. Yeah. And just one last thing, okay. Um, application in LoRa, again, if you guys wanna use it for your projects, um, is like, you cannot hear <laughs> Um, application in Laura is um, for some background. Okay, low rank just means that instead of having one big matrix, you have two smaller matrices, and you can actually prove that if you have two smaller matrices, it still adds that it still adds multiplies back to the original one, and yet it has far fewer parameters, right? Which is kind of which is kind of amazing. Um, of course. You are constraining your representation capacity. Maybe some things are less flexible. Um, but if you are just doing some lightweight fine tuning, this is pretty powerful. Um, and it's pretty low resource as well. Um, and then one more thing for Laura is that um, this is this stays frozen, which means that in the backdrop, um, you don't update it at all. Whereas over here, um, this is the one gets learned. So you learn far fewer parameters. You have to do far fewer gradient updates, which makes well, backprop and just the whole training process faster, right? And then you go to QLaura, which is kind of the same thing, except you quantize stuff, right? So again, it's even more faster, even more heuristics to squeeze more performance out. And then there's this funny idea in QLaura where it's like, oh, um, if you have low rank, it limits the representation capacity. So why don't we just add more adapters? So you just literally add more trainable parameters and it still kind of works. And yeah, that is the end. Um, here are some discussion questions for you guys, food for thoughts. If you guys want to ask me it during the Q and A, and yeah, that's it. Cool. Okay. So we are quite behind time, but uh, if there are any quick questions, uh, it's probably good to take them now while Marcus is on stage, and um, we have some questions. Why yeah, don't they nice. use like the uh, uh, float A instead of uh, in, I mean, why do they use in the instead of float A? Yeah, good question. Um, when you have um, when you are in the floating point to make it so that you can extend it from negative infinity to infinity, um, the thirty two bits are actually split um between different parts. So like in the thirty two bits, you have one that's like a significant. And then like a power, and then like a term, and essentially like for in A, it means that you have very low precision, floating point A. You have you have too low precision. Okay, so I think what Marcus is saying is that the floating point representation uh, decomposes a number into several yeah. different parts, and uh, in integer representation, you're just um, putting all of the things into a, a single number. Yeah, it's like something like. Um, yeah, it's like, it's right. Like, so, like, uh, like what Marcus is saying, when you do floating point, you have a uh, an actual number taken to a certain power. So the power is uh, yeah. a separate part of the representation, and the number is another part of the representation. So, if you think about a floating point number, it's like 
something dot, uh, you know, something decimal, blah, 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 to 10 to the X, right? Oh, right, right? Yeah, so the 10 to the X is the power part that you're representing with some bits. And then the number representations, the, you know, 1.234567, right? And so that allows you to represent any number with a, a certain amount of precision. So that's why um, I think so, that's not being present. So uh, just now there was NF4, right? Instead, so they, right. they're choosing to use NF4 instead of any 4 So why does the same principle like? Um, oh. You mean on the Laura paper? Um, OK, right. So NF4 is not the typical idea of floats. NF4 just means that you split um, the distribution into equally spaced quantiles, quantiles meaning equal area, right? And then you define like it to be at like the center here, right? So like the quant, so like, like everything here in the red would get mapped to so like this value, everything in green would get mapped to this value, everything in the blue would get mapped to this value, et cetera, right? So, so you might still represent an NF4 in in four, right? Is, is that what you're saying? It's just that it's equally spaced so that you compare the range into the right, the right values. Um, okay, there, 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 there are extra complexities to this. Um, there's actually something called double quantization where they quantize the quantized um, <laughs> conversion factors. If you want to read about it, it's in the full paper. Um, I can talk to you about that after. So if, if there's something like an F8, that would actually be pre preferable, maybe for Q, uh, some kind of Q-Laura. Uh, you know, if we were doing Q-Laura, maybe like eight bits, uh, yeah, eight bit precision. Um, yeah, to me, as far as I know, no one's tried that yet. So it's like, it's very much like a balancing act between like all this stuff. Um, You can try it if you want. Be the first one to publish that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you're good with machine-oriented libraries and you know how to do encoding big and in linear in the end, that, that might be a, a good project because all of these types of things, they fit within a, a single machine, right? So, uh, and it has a lot of impact. I think uh, Marcus was showing some. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Something on how we constrain, right? But let's say you do like these book kind of conversation and there was one hardware. Sorry, I didn't hear. But like, some, like composition sometimes can be part of the constraint. So like, uh, like, it was like, like the beef book kind of you can use them like the one hundred or so more specific to cut from what I recall. I'm pretty sure that's just a driver constraint. Oh, yeah. In in theory, there should be a constraint. Okay. Yeah. That's a practitioner's problem. Yeah. Uh, anything else? All right. Okay. Let's thank cool. our speaker. Should I write that? Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. So our final speaker is, I think, Vatsaya. Okay, for those of you who need to go, I know it's uh, quite late, you, you're welcome to go and then pick up uh, for next week. But if you don't mind staying around, uh, we'll, we'll finish the segment off. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk about distillation and uh, it is another technique to lower the size of the model. And uh, uh, I'm going to present a paper by, a paper by Victor San. It's a uh, distilled bird and uh, it has proved to like provide the same efficiency as a bird model and being pretty low in size and has a uh, 60%, it is 60% faster than the base bird model. And size is a big problem. And with bigger models, it is hard to put them into like real world scenarios and real applications. And uh, in a lot of cases on edge applications. So, and it also has a lot of, uh, it, it has a huge computation cost. So this paper seeks to solve that problem by a process called uh, distillation. So uh, these are, this is the size of uh, like 
with new models and how they've been progressing pretty fast. This data is only till uh, July 2019. And as you know, that uh, the recent models are even bigger in size. So uh, what is knowledge distillation? Knowledge distillation is just uh, is a compression technique in which a compact model like a student is trained on uh, the parameters of a teacher and it is trained to reproduce the behavior of a larger model. In this case, the uh, bird-based model. And uh, there are a, a lot of limitations of uh, like bigger models like the computation cost or the environmental cost of exponentially scaling those models. So the student is trained with uh, a distillation loss. So that it's trained with uh, in, in a total of three losses. The, the distillation loss uh, that is uh, computed by the cost cross entropy between uh, the so, uh, the teacher model and the student model, and uh, because of the inherent architecture of a bird model, the mass language modeling loss. Uh, they also use a cosine embedding loss as well to align the direction of the student and uh, teacher's hidden stake vectors. Uh, why is it based on these laws? Because uh, it has the same architecture as uh, the bird, and it because of the common uh, dimensionality between the teacher and the student, they initialize it by taking one layer uh, at a time. So they take one layer out of two uh, from the base model. That's why it's uh, low, uh, it's smaller in size and it's faster. And it, it is trained on uh, the same uh, general corpus as the BERT model, which is the English Wikipedia and the Toronto Book Corpus. So these are the results. And uh, Dissel BERT is always on par over the ELMO baseline. And uh, it is pretty good at uh, some tasks such as uh, uh, general language understanding, and it has uh, forty percent fewer parameters. Well, uh, this was a uh, pretty. This was pretty interesting, and uh, it was trained on uh, uh, some Q and A tasks such as uh, squad, and that led to uh, an increased accuracy of around uh, one point five percent. And still, it was uh, sixty percent faster, as you can see here. And uh, lastly, uh, I want to talk about uh, why they uh, were like optimizing it on uh, a total of three laws because uh, uh, as you can see that the variation was the least when uh, they removed the mass language uh, model loss. And uh, it was a lot more if they removed the cosine loss or the uh, cross entropy, so the variation between the teacher model and the student model. Building on this, there's uh, one more uh, paper that is distilling step by step. Uh, it is it builds on a, a distillation of larger language models, but here we uh, also talk about uh, uh, rationale. So, uh, like. As a general practice, we can see that a, a lot of uh, models can uh, reason as well. So it is trained on uh, rational as well. And it takes a lot of uh, unlabeled data and it uses a chain of th thought prompting on uh, larger models to output labels along with their rationals. So it uh, uses these rationals to task labels and train smaller downstream tasks. Uh, it is a bit different from uh, knowledge distillation or learning through large language models. It is uh, that uh, two basic reasons. One, uh, it doesn't need inference at test time, so that leads to uh, lower computational costs, and uh, it also means that uh, like overall inference time would be lower. And uh, it uses the generated rationals as supervision instead of as a prompt. So that leads to uh, this is how it works so you uh, take okay i can use the, okay so you take a premise you uh, take a hypothesis with it as well from a large language model and on a smaller model you run the same thing and uh, the optimization is uh, in 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 such a way that uh, 
one is the uh, label prediction loss and the second would be the rational prediction loss so it builds on it and uh, that is why it can predict outcomes which are based on a larger model but can be more efficient on a smaller model set so these are the data sets and uh, trained on uh, only 20 12.5% uh, of NLI data set it uh, did uh, overperform uh, fine tuned uh, models and uh, standard estimation there are some limitations uh, like uh, during the pre training process they require users to produce a few example dem demonstrations the model incurs slight training time computational overhead but that is only during pre training and uh, there can be a lot of reasonings, uh, limitations such as uh, the rationals produced by large language models. They are sometimes they're not at par and uh, they can't replace human uh, rationals, but human rationals are uh, first they're expensive and they're hard to come by. So uh, that's why they have used it. And uh, it is that uh, that's the whole point of it that it is based on rationals of teacher. NL. Thank you. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Any questions for this last segment? Are you guys clear about how to do the solution? Okay, so uh, all right, so we'll see you guys next week for week six, which is our final semester, uh, final week before recess. We don't have a, a class during recess week, uh, just project consultation. So just a reminder again, for everyone in the class, you need to turn in your proposal for project slide, uh, slide back one to the project channel. Okay, uh, hopefully by tonight. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks to the